Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I thank uh, TAC and Point Lines for the opportunity to speak here today. I hope they're as happy with the talk afterwards, so that's the only thing I can say. I talked about it from being for a relatively young person's perspective because, as Donna mentioned, I was 56 when I was diagnosed. The person who was involved in my diagnosis, strangely enough, was my mum, who was 97 at the time. And she used to say to me, Sarah, there's something wrong with your memory. You know, you really need to go and see somebody about it. And I used to get so lucky, I gotta tell you. And I ignored it for a very long time, but I think she knew what was going on, but she didn't want to be the one to tell me, but she did want me to find out. So this is about the important points to remember, and from my perspective, it's before I forget, because down the track, given my short-term memory issues, that is something that will definitely happen. So I thought it might be worth while giving you a quick backstory, and this one's an absolute beauty. I have a significant other medical history, and they're all related to the brain, and in fact, in my lines, people would say, yep, yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, I've got multiple uh, brain and spinal problems and uh, a neuromuscular disorder as well. And I had brain surgeries 89 in July 2013 in a period of three weeks, so you can imagine that was a really good thing to do the event. And I've got arthritis and I'm up to 14 now and counting. Always put this photo up because this generally tends to be the appearance of most doctors when I see them for the first time. Uh, I look at the records and I think, oh, dear God. And I used to have a specialist who, uh, in RPA, had great fun with the students when he'd say, oh, go and find out serious diagnosis. And of course, they would be working through it all, and you could see the confusion coming onto the faces. What were the problems then? I was actually a really good reader. I used to read two to three books a week. I loved reading. It was my go-to comfort food. I used to do a lot. Suddenly, I found I had a problem. We're finding skills. I used to have lots of issues with what the. And I'm trying to think of a word for this or that or the other, and I can never do it. Planning skills. I used to say, and I still do, I couldn't get my way out of the paper bag with directions pointing up. I was hopeless. Trouble processing information. My mother occasionally, in her more cynical state, she was very alert when she, uh, in her 90s, and she'd say, the light's on and no one's home. And that was fairly true. And the other thing I would say is my short-term memory was shot. And for a long while I used to say I had the memory of a goldfish till I found out a goldfish remembers for two weeks. Now it's more like a fruit fry, and a fruit fry remembers for about 27 seconds. And if you ask me how we know that, I've got no idea. And handwriting, trying to get my brain to write a word. The only thing I write these days is my name. And that's only very occasional. What's challenging about the diagnosis? Well, I lost a career spanning 40 years working in health. Got a little letter one day saying I didn't have a job anymore. That was a bit of a downer. Then, of course, uh, loss of friendships. Well, I tell you what, you was the one I had uh, once I announced the diagnosis that people thought I was going to make them run naked with them down the street. And I described it with all the friendships that I lost that we all became straight, shall we say. We weren't friends anymore, we were just uh, strangers with shared memories, if you ask me. The other thing that really at the time got me down uh, was how sometimes the media looked at us. And in a very fragile state, I saw a, an article one day in The Guardian in 2015, and it described people with dementia as mad, bad, and dangerous to know. Well, I can't tell you the letter I wrote to that. It was amusing. And the condescending, pontificating reply I got, to which I gave him uh, written. Uh, 
three thinking responses to what I thought of uh, his remarks because to me it just stated it how little um, sort of understanding and uh, care the society seemed to have for us at the time. And it really shattered me. The other thing I had was a great fear for the future. Because, you know, what the heck was going to happen? But back to getting the diagnosis in 2012 and 2013, I had uh, neuropsych testing done, which showed a marked deterioration in every marker I had, the whole lot. And the, do the doctor said to me at the time, you'll never work again. And I looked at him like he had a second head. But I'll tell you what, he was right. I never did because I couldn't read anymore properly. I haven't read a book in five years. Um, so many things went wrong. Somebody told me to visit Dementia Australia. I think they knew what was wrong. And they said, I'll go for memory, <laughs> memory exercises that will help, help your mind. And the chap went through it all. And just to give you an explanation, at the end, he gave me a piece of paper with the top folded down. And he said, have a look through the list and tell me what you think. Look through the list, because they're all just short statements. I said, yeah, they're all me. He said, yeah, I agree with you, they're all you. He said, now I want you to have a look at the top. And he said, you need to go back to your neuro neurologist. And the top said, the features of early onset dementia. I use that image because I think of what at the time, I swear to God, it might have happened in real time, but my brain exploded. It was like my past had gone up in flames. That knowledge that said, this is what's wrong with you, was incinerating my present, and my future was about to go. And I was wondering about this woman. I was grey at the time, of this colour, grey at the time, and I, I had my dogs, my garden, which I love greatly. A lot of activities going on at the time. And I wondered what would happen to her. Would I end up going to a place where I didn't know where I was at? And I didn't know how to get back. What I miss about my diagnosis was that, as I mentioned, I've got hydrocephalic dementia, which at the time was a treatable form, but having said that, I would remind people that treatable is not curable. And just for information, there are seven treatables, and another treatable would be hypoglycemic, diabetic dementia, which does occur. So that's why people with diabetes should be really, really good looking up at their diet and their exercise so that they don't increase the incidence of dementia in their lives. And five non-treatables, and one of those would be vascular, which I now have, that's why I have a mix form. There are over 100 classifications of dementia, 102 at this stage, and Alzheimer's, for example, is stratified into, I think it's six classifications. The mistakes I made about getting diagnosed was, well, for the first 18 months I curled up in hall. I was in pitiful denial, because I kept on saying this can't be right, this can't be right. And then I would be in raging anger. God heard a lot about me that day, those days. Because the, the culmination of it all was petrifying fear. In doing so, I was being truly present in my own life, and that is something I try to be each and every day now, because I know my future is going to be taken from me at some point, so I try to make sure I'm present every day now. The opportunity for help earlier on, I, I really shut down. I didn't talk to anybody, didn't want to know anybody, go away. And I lost valuable time. What, were the pro what are the problems now, and probably were the problems then? Reading and writing. As I said, I haven't read a book in five years. I don't write because me trying to write is the most painful thing to see happen. Word finding and planning, all of that has really been very fractured, uh, hit, you name it, it is affected because there are days, some days I'm okay and some days I've got two of my support workers with me down there and I say to them, I can't think, I can't think and it's, I can't grasp those words. 
processing in memory, trying to work out what I've got to do, memory. I, I can literally walk from one room to the next and it is gone in a heartbeat, whatever I was thinking about. Perception and balance. God, I can't tell you how many times I've fallen over grounds, black sprays, not good for me, broken hands, surgery, you name it, it's happened. My balance is good. The girls all watch me, they're always saying, watch that, watch this, and it's true, I fall over everything. Sensory issues, um, taste and smell, you wouldn't want me around the fire, wouldn't pick it up. Uh, hearing is also affected, I had, I had a hearing this start early on in the game plan and the audiologist was really quick to say, and it was before I was diagnosed, he said, I don't know what's going on with you, he said, but there, you've got no hearing problem, but you've got something organically wrong between the auditory canal and your brain, and that's the problem. And that probably would have been the first indication. Touch. I, I find um, I get really itchy, that touch is just annoying. And, and you know those people who hate having showers, the reason they hate having showers is because water hitting their skin just makes their brain inflate. Play. The other thing that affect, I'm affected by is sleep disturbance. Um, I've been known to do a 180 degree flip out of bed overnight and be staring up the ceiling like this because my dreams are so vivid that I can't tell the difference between reality and the dream. So I'll put myself out of bed. So all those things, all those things are affected each and every day of my life. And really we're just talking about living. Just living. Best ways of managing it, well up for a long time, I've had everything on automatic payments. Because if I didn't, I'd be sitting in the dark with no water to the house, so I've got to have automatic payments. The other thing I've done is that I've got electronic calendars and I call them gizmos. I, I wrote that down at the time because I've actually got uh, an Alexa. And if I use a name in the house, she always asks me what do I want. And that's annoying. <laughs> so uh, Alexa keeps a record of everything I need. You know, my pharmacy, uh, uh, if I'm running out of stuff, I look to her, I check it, uh, I know what I've got to get. So, and I've, I've linked to all my calendars, not only are they linked to me, but they are linked to the people who look after me. I have help seven days a week, uh, twice a day, because I live in my own home on my own. And um, it's linked to the people that I, I work with. And for example, if I have a call in my home, I can call to Alexa and say, Alexa, drop in on here. And Pip can say yes because it opens up in her house and she'll say yes. I've had a fall, which has happened, right? I must do it. And I can get help without having to get to a phone and get to somebody. So there are absolutely amazing technologies that for people who have the skills they should learn about. The other thing I did was I made sure that I had my legal paperwork out of the way. Once I knew my diagnosis, I got my will done, uh, which I didn't have done at the time. I got my uh, power of attorney, my guardianship, most important, my advanced medical directive. Because I wanted to make sure that people knew exactly what they were going to do at the end of my life. I wasn't having unnecessary radiology, I wasn't having unnecessary anything. If I was so affected by my condition that I could not communicate, I could not think for myself, let me go. Now, under the euthanasia laws, I'm not allowed, I'm precluded because I have dementia. So I had to write the document myself that told everybody exactly what they are and are not allowed to do. And I had it signed by both my doctor and my lawyer, because I'm that way in mind, former risk manager, and get like that. And uh, I had those protections for me. 
And when no one else files, I spell. You know, when I can't do something, I ask one of the girls to do it more. You know, I've given up driving now. I need help getting from place to place, ask for help. And then I try to get on with living, which is most important. Diet, yes, well, we won't talk too much about that. So I get walking, lots of walking when I can. I still try and do games, puzzles, a bit of reading, uh, a lot of listening, and I'll explain that one in a couple of points. And socialising. It's really important for people with dementia to continue to socialise for as long as they can. Get out with the mates. Other things to do. I love black and white movies. I can watch the same... Uh, Oh, I'm trying to think of Charlie Chan, I'm not Charlie Chan. I could watch the same black and white Charlie Chan a dozen times over, no problem. Love black and white movies. I manage Facebook groups. We've got a group called Joining the Dots for Dimension. We've got 2,000 members. I set it up to about eight years ago. And it's a group to provide support, online support for people who have dementia, care of his family. Um, joining the dots. I think that, and I've also got another one called It's All in Our Heads for People with Green Brain Disorders. Um, as I said, I still do a bit of reading, all of those things, public speaking, research. I'm involved in more research than you can point a stick at, quite often. And I love my music. That's the other thing that I do love. Like. Still always, this is the listening one. Now, if anybody who knows the ABC, you can absolutely count on the fact that when they do the news every half hour, they will repeat at least four out of six of those items every half hour. So that creates a bit of currency in my mind of information. So that when I'm talking to people about, you know, God forbid Donald Trump, um, but whoever, whatever, I have the currency of the information of the day, so I love the ABC. Of course, involved with lives, and um, I sit on the uh, National Advisory Committee for Dementia Australia. Uh, I do gardening. If you look closely at my nose, you would see the dirt underneath it because I do a lot of gardening. And of course, I still own my playing games, uh, looking at sorts of games. I've got birds, half a dozen of those. Two dogs, they're, they're Bonnie and Clive, but uh, the recent condition is this guy, Hannah, and he is pretty much that, in struggle. Uh, the challenges of dealing with dementia. Pre pretending to be a functioning adult is quite simply exhausting, because this is generally the, about a half an hour ago, when I saw our previous speaker having a little bit of a challenge with the slides, that was me because I started to well up at the panic and stress because it's what happens to me if I think I'm losing control of something that's going on. So yeah, pretending to be a functioning adult is exhausting. Now this is the point where I'm going to dip it. Just slightly and ask a question. How many among you know that children have dementia? Anybody want to whip up their hands? How many know? Okay, there are a couple, but we don't have a whole room for doing this. Well, they do. The fact every third day, a child is born in Australia with a genetic condition that has as its principal features the symptoms of dementia. And there are at least seven genetic conditions that can cause those features. Around one in every 2,800 babies is born with a genetic condition that will cause them to have childhood dementia. This is more than those born from more well-known conditions such as cystic fibrosis. Childhood dementia costs the Australian economy at the moment about eight, 389 million. It's expected to cost us four billion in the next decade. But I'll say something about that in a minute. An estimated 2,300 Australians are currently living with uh, childhood dementia, which is similar in number to those with major neuro disease. 
And what I must re-emphasize about this, with all the conditions children can get, you know, childhood cancer, etc., there's the likelihood of survival. A child born with a genetic condition that has its principal features, dementia, is not going to survive much past their twenties. And that's the facts of it. Childhood dementia causes a similar number of deaths each year as does childhood cancer. Now look, there's something that really annoys me at the moment, and not that I don't undervalue the issue of childhood cancer. They pay, they provided support to the tune of about 17,000 a year. But do you know what the child with the symptoms of dementia gets? Do. $2,000. Now these children frequently end up in wheelchairs, end up non-verbal, they will die. But that's what they're given as support. So that 385, nine million is way under what is really needed to support these kids. These are the faces of the kids with dementia. I'll go back and get this one. This is Lucy McKay, she's seven, who's got patterns. The next little girl, uh, Marion, she's two. She was diagnosed at two with human Hicks disease. Then you've got this little girl, Miriam Cunningham. Miriam's special to me because her mother fought and fought and fought for her to be diagnosed. Kept on saying, as mothers do, they know when there's something wrong with their little girl or their little boy. And finally, at the age of two, they did the brain scan three months before she died. Her brain was like cotton wool. And I mean, it was like cotton wool. Amelia and Molly Carroll can be genetic, family, running family. And this little boy, Georgie Young, he's got that disease. So these kids, the faces of dementia, and I always put them up because I don't think people really grasp it can be children who can be affected by this illness. Symptoms of childhood dementia, similar to us, memory, memory loss, confusion, trouble concentrating, personality changes, severity, sleep, behavioural issues such as hyperactivity. I will remember one mother whose little child was diagnosed three months after this statement from the teacher. The teacher said, you know, the problem is your parenting skills. It wasn't the parenting skills, it was that the little child had new hips disease. Emotional issues such as anxiety and fear. They also experience seizures, which is not something that happens so much in adults, but it certainly happens in children loss of vision, loss of ability to move, problems with bones, joints, cardiovascular, respiratory, because remember, as I said, these children will die, right? So do any of these sound familiar? It's very much like us, but it's in children. I always put this up because I think it's really important to talk very accurately about it. The problem is not that he or she forgets, or in my case, that. It's the fact that part of our brain, even yeah, so slowly, is dying off. Filament by filament, it's going. I, I said to somebody today, I think it was, I'm not the person I was five or ten years ago. I wouldn't even recognise that person, and that person would not recognise me. She was a woman who would get up and clean her own gutters. She was a woman who cleaned windows and walls and mow and do extraordinary things around home. Looked after it all by herself, no problem. And looked after a sick mum at the time. But the problem is the brain is dying and memories are being erased. And this is the image that to me tells it all. This is what I feel is happening to my brain. This is what I know other people feel who have got dementia that is happening to their brain. So yeah, the problem is that our brains are dying 
and angry to them with that. So what do we need to do? We need to become dementia-friendly communities. We need to have this. We need to eradicate. We need to eradicate the ignorance that goes on about dementia. So we need to upskill people, get them to check out their old ideas and understand and empower themselves by learning about what dementia is. We do this by educating. So upcycle the information, make sure it's current. You know, how many people know that there are 102 types of it? How many people know there are six levels of Alzheimer's? How many people know that kids get dementia? Get out there and learn about this condition because I'll tell you something, one in three over the age of 80 will get the symptoms of cognitive decline. No ifs, no buts, that's the age. And then one in two over nine. And the other thing we need to do, we need to elevate and uplift our thinking about dementia. I don't want to live apart from you in the community. I want to live with you. I want to live in your society, but I need you to understand that generally I have, when I'm talking to you and I look like a deer in the headlights, it's because my following of the conversation has just drifted off and I don't really follow conversations. I try, but I don't always follow them very well. What can we say about dementia? Well, I reckon dementia is about two things. It's about loss, loss of everything, you know. Oh, God, everything changes. But then again, it's about hope. I'm a strong believer in that. And a chap by the name of Shri, she always says, hope knows no fear. Hope dares to blossom, blossom in, even in the abysmal abyss. And I will tell you, there is no more abysmal abyss than having a diagnosis of dementia. Hope secretly feeds and strengthens promise. And remember the acronym of hope. Hope opens people's eyes. Today I hope I've opened your eyes about dementia about the extent of it, about the prevalence of it for children in our society. Remember, every third day a child is born with a genetic condition in Australia that has as its main symptom dementia. And what's my name? This is a favourite saying of mine. It's about faith whispering to the warrior that you cannot withstand the war storm and the warrior whispering back that I am the storm. And I hope I am. I really do. Thank you. Yeah.